And you are live on PM Express uh, this evening. And this evening, a very controversial topic we've chosen for you to digest, which is depoliticizing the office of the IGP, the curious case of Hassantia Kutu. And indeed, it's a very curious one. If you look at the replacement of the Inspector General of, of Police, Asante Petu with his deputy, uh, James, James Opombuiru, as a, as a former proceeds on leave, and that's a curious one, pending his retirement, and it has generated a lot of controversy. That, there's, a, there's an obvious reason why. Uh, they, this gentleman there, who is the, uh, the communications director of the presidency, just yesterday uh, issued a, a, a statement to the public announcing that the IGP has been asked to proceed on leave with immediate effect and he should hand over to the man who was acting, who was his deputy, uh, that is the, uh, the, the, the Deputy Inspector General of Police, James Opombuenu, will continue to act in his stead. Now, the, the curiosity of all this, and has come in some of the reactions, is the fact that the man, the IGP himself, was just bailed to leave. His contract was built to, be ex to expire on the 14th of August, which is just a few weeks away. I mean, maximum four weeks away. And yet, a decision has been taken for him to leave now and hand over to his deputy. The minority guys have been reacting to this in Parliament. They criticize the president for the manner in which he's taken the decision to ask the IGP and, and, and let him go. Now, the legislator is also worried that the fact that this gentleman who is going to occupy that position in an acting position will be acting alone would affect his performance because he believes that the, the president will, he will act to please this man, who is a first gentleman of, the, a gentleman of the land, and will not be in an authoritative position to make the decisions that will be in your best interest to protect you, but to be in the best interest of a political master. That is a minority's concern. Some security analysts have also described the decision as curious, where just one month just left for the man to proceed to proceed on leave, or well, to leave off for his expiration of his contract. Especially as the president, as we know now, assigns no reasons for asking that a man that he himself extended his contract should leave just before that expiration happens. It raises questions with the procedure of selecting the IGP. And we've been having this conversation for a while, especially on the back of the issues with the vigilante issue. But the, what has happened yesterday has brought it back into sharp focus. I'm, I have a panel that will be helping us deal with this fundamental question. How do we depoliticize the office of the IGP? Remember that it's, an, it's a political appointment. The president, the politician, appointed him, extended his contract, has decided to let him go without any explanation. Does he owe us an explanation? Some may say no. We'll ask what our experts think when they sit down for the discussion. Stay with us on PM Express. Live on PM Express tonight, my guest in the studio, uh, Adnan Bona, is the CEO of the Security Warehouse Limited. Also joining me is Paul Avui, who is a retired superintendent of police. Uh, joining us by live link from his home tonight is Kenel Festos Abwaje, who is a security analyst. Hello, uh, Kenel, thank you for your time on PM Express Live from your home. Yes, yes and I'm grateful that he could join us. Also, uh, Bill to join us uh, tonight. Uh, was Superintendent Peter Tobu, who is a former Executive Secretary to the IGP. Uh, he had agreed to talk to us, um, but he called 30 minutes ago to say uh, he's been asked to pull off. Um, we should excuse him for now. Um, he didn't give me any details beyond that, and I had to respect that. And so uh, you won't hear him on the conversation because he's asked to be excused, although he had agreed earlier to be part of this conversation. And, and there's a reason why we had invited him, because one, he was a former executive secretary to the IGP, but we know that last week or two, he has, uh, in fact, declared his, his ambitions, his political ambitions openly, to contest as a parliamentary candidate on the ticket of the NDC in a constituency up north. And that has come in for some, uh, some controversy in the wake of the decision to some say, in effect, sack the IGP uh, weeks before he was, he was due to leave office honorably, as has been described. And so I want to start from there, just to clear this up um, from those who know, who know this. 
Um, uh, Alan Bonner, you were on this same show a month or two back when um, Superintendent Peter Tobu was here. He had just recently just left, retired from the service. Correct. If I'm not mistaken, that time it was just a month. A yeah, month, a month, exactly one month. A month, exactly one month yeah. since he retired. And so he, he literally retired, if I'm not mistaken, April or so there yeah. about, or May, when he retired, he retired from the service. And, and everybody was wondering, why was the young man retired as early? Um, but he did retire. Now we know he's going to run as a member of parliament on the ticket of the NDC somewhere in the north. Um, and some have said that for, he was so close, he was executive. Executive Secretary of the IGP, he knew everything. Such a sensitive position, and yet he was he, he was honing and, and harboring a political ambition. Should that be an issue? Within the context of the security structure we have and the IGP knowing um, how sensitive security-wise that position is? Well, thank you very much, and thank you to the viewers. No, it shouldn't be an issue. Mm. From where I sit, uh, I've spoken about this uh, particular resignation by my good friend Peter, Peter Tobu, who is also a brother. My point is that uh, 1966, Kwame Nkrumah, the first Republic, uh, Republican president, was toppled by the police mm -hmm. and the military. Mm. Okay, They were toppled by the police and the military. And so fast forward, if we have the fourth Republic and we have police officers who and maybe some military officers who, instead of using the barrel of the gun or using firearms we have purchased for them in their uniform and we accommodate them and all that, uh, you know, instead of attempting to topple a democratically elected government, they retire honorably from the service to be able to follow through a particular political ambition. I think that we should celebrate it mm. instead of uh, making noise about it. Mm. I, I would, I have said on other platforms that I prefer all police officers in Ghana and military officers resign and probably join whichever party they want to join mm. rather than have police officers and military officers who come together yeah. in uh, an attempt to overthrow uh, a certain government. Retire soup. So is this an issue that a seven officer just, just before his boss is sacked also resigns to go full political. You have been in the service before. Is this is that an issue for you? No, it's not an issue. Um, uh, good evening to the viewers. Um, it's not an issue because uh, uh, it's a question of choice. Okay. You see, it's a question of choice. And uh, um, he, he went on voluntary retirement yes. to enter into politics. So I think it is his personal decision. decision. So I don't think yeah, too much should be, be read into that. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you then. Let's let's go into the main conversation while we're here, and we'll bring in um, a kind of essence of budget shortly uh, on this as well. But I want to start with you, Mr. Uh, uh, is this normal practice in the service for an IGP of a very senior, high-ranking police officer who's just about to retire? I mean, as as soon as two, three weeks away. 14th of, of August, to be very specific, just a month from now. Uh, is it normal for that individual to be, to be asked to proceed on leave with immediate effect pending his, his going on, 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 on retirement? Well, this borders on um, the, the loophole in the, the law that we use in, the, the law that is used in granting extension to public officers. Okay. Um, we have ha we've had about 26 years of uh, democratic uh, governance. And that the Fourth Republic. Uh, the Fourth Republic. And um, the first IGP to be given an extension of office mm -hmm. is uh, the, the immediate past, uh, what do you call it? Well, the former, a former Inspector General of Police. Uh, uh, Mohammed al -Hassan. Yes. You know. He was the first. Yes. Under this Fourth, fourth Republic. Republic. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. I thought there had been yeah. others before. No. no. Oh, so that's the first time this happened. So he yeah. was the president. He was the first. Yeah, he was the first because. That's a curious one. Yeah. You know, he had at least less than six months yes. to retire. Yeah. 
So he was given uh, what? It was even an extension of service mm -hmm. for for two years, yes. I think. And then when his time came, he was asked to go, you know. And so um, the case of Mr. Pietu is similar, one way or the other, because he also had about six of, a little less than six months to retire. Mm -hmm. And then he was also given an extension of service, you know. But you see, the law is silent on a lot of things. Um, the Act 5, is it Act 5 to 7? Mm -hmm. The 5 to 7 or so. Um, talks about the... Um, This is on public offices generally, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. not necessarily IGP. No, no, but but because the the um, the service is uh, under the public public service. services, yes, yeah. So it was covered by. That but 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 the, but the point is, I'm sure you look for it substantively. You can quote for me, but but yeah, the point. Yeah, it's here. Mm -hmm. um, it's. Um, Notwithstanding clause one of this article, that's article 199, which says that uh, at age 60, public officers should retire. Uh -huh. Notwithstanding clause one of this article, a public officer who has retired from the public service after attaining the age of 60 years may, where the ex exigencies of the service require, be engaged for a limited period of not more than two years or a time, but not exceeding five years in all and upon it and upon such other terms and conditions as the appointing authority shall determine mm, in this case yeah, the president yeah so you see if you are making a law like this no eligibility criteria you say may and no situational criteria no mm. si that's exigencies it's it just totally up to discretion of yeah, the president yeah exigencies what, what type of it exigencies it must probably describe the exigencies which we require that an officer's uh, um, a period of uh, retirement could be extended for two under years these circumstances or more. So yeah. it has to be clear yes and okay. then the the, the what, what do we call it the criteria must be there who qualifies for that for the extension yeah because this one it, whether it is meant for heads of institutions it's not clear okay or whether heads of institution may recommend a subordinate officer for his services to be his uh, contract to be given a contract is not clear yeah. and, and, and then and then and then it's also silent on whether he could be moved out before the expulsion of the extension yeah. yeah okay i mean but but that's a curious one but but knowing what you know of the service that you were in is this something that if it happens and it has happened the way it's happened. Is this yeah. something that we'll be taking as, as, the, the, as, the, as normal? The, the curiosity in the whole thing is that he has only about three weeks to go for, the, for his extension of service to, to end. To end. Mm -hmm. And then he was asked to proceed on leave. Mm -hmm. Normally, when, uh, when uh, uh, you have, you, you in the service, normally when you are, you are due to retire, you are given a notice okay. for one year. Yeah. You see, and during that one year notice, it, it will specify the period or the date on which you must start your terminal leave. Okay. And so when you start your terminal leave, you, you start your terminal leave, and that is an, at the end of the time that you'll be 60 years, then that means... Uh, uh, so I see your point you're but making. If you don't have any leave at all, you will you will give him given the letter but then you 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 don't have a leave so when you are 60 years you must go but when you have an accumulated leave for maybe 42 42 days 84 day 84 days or three months of uh, 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 leave it is calculated in such a way that as soon as your leave expires your period in the service ends okay 
So, 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 what, it, so, so, so it, the, it, the point you're making is, mm -hmm. what has happened to Santiago Pietu isn't normal. No, it's not. It's not normal. But, but what if he indeed had outstanding leave of a month or three weeks, which is what he's been asked to take? No. Um, it's difficult to... No, you said no. Why, why, why no, do you say no? I, I, I say no because, first of all, uh, if you look at the way the security architecture all over the world is, you would see this type of situation where there is an attempted coup. I mean, that is how serious. If you Even when, for instance, let's say a particular political party loses an election and one comes in, mm. the norm is that the heads of those institutions would usually present a resignation letter to the head of state. Mm. And the head of state would have to accept their resignation from them so you don't literally chase them out of office. Has it been chased out of office? I mean, if you, if you have an IGP whom you have asked to serve, you have given an extension to for two years, and you call him one morning and he's told that uh, with immediate effect, you leave office. So he drives the GP1 in the morning by 12 o'clock, by 1 o'clock, he's no more. There is no dispatch rider in front of him. It doesn't happen that way. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I mean, my, 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 yeah, friend, I mean my good friend here... Is here if uh, and been, yeah, yeah, he's in the service for longer. So if there has been <laughs> even even the only time we came close under the probably the fourth republic yeah. is when the then uh, national security coordinator also Francis Poku. You remember that? Yes, incident? yes, yes, yes. When when and he had to be forced out and, and the left. Only only time that I can remember in recent years that we've had a situation. Like this. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let, me, let me bring in Colonel Fessor Sabwaji. Uh, Colonel, thank you for staying with us uh, live from, you, from, 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 from your home. Retired Colonel, um, let me. Are, 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 we, are, are we exaggerating this? Or, or what we've just had? And I'm, I'm grateful that we had um, the, the retired uh, superintendent with us who served in the service for so long. And he says, this isn't something that you're used to in the service. What's your own take on this? Is this something that we're exaggerating? Yeah, good evening, my regards to uh, my other colleagues uh, at the studio. I don't think we are exaggerating. But granted that the president has the prerogative to appoint and then to release, I think the office of the IGP should be entitled to some considerable amount of respect. Because if that office is not treated or regarded the way that it should be, it is not only about the IGP who is treated that way. It is about the entire service, the image within the public sphere you see it. And granted that uh, this gentleman has served uh, his country for probably around 30 years. Mm -hmm. You see, for him to be released under these circumstances, for reasons that, as you said, nobody seems to know, except that we think that it's a bit political. I don't think that is the way we should, we should treat um, very, very senior officers. But aside of the police, Within the armed forces, <clears throat> I think the only case, <clears throat> and I stand to be corrected, was probably in 1965 mm. when Kwame Nkrumah dismissed uh, Ankara and Otu. At that time, we know that there were serious repercussions because that became a grievance for Kutuka and Okran. Mm as well as Hali and Deku, to gang up and get rid of Kwame Nkrumah. Of course, we come very far. And we don't expect that the dismissal and no proceed on leave paradigm of Mr. Santia Pietu is going to be used by anybody as an excuse you know, to, to disturb the national uh, peace. But I think it shouldn't have been treated that way. We could have found a better way to allow him quietly, administratively, to go on leave, you see, without attaching the proceed on leave and you are replaced uh, by so and so and so.
but, but, but Colonel, um, you, you raise a very important point. I don't point. think. I but respect the decision of the, of the president, but I don't think that uh, we handle it the right way. However, he is the commander-in-chief, he is the appointer as guaranteed by the, by the Constitution. Whatever exigencies, and we don't know this, mm -hmm. I'll come to the whether we are entitled to know, mm -hmm. may have forced the president, and we shouldn't forget mm -hmm. within the context of the fact that it is the same president who, when he took power, said, Asantia Pitu is my man. Although he's reached a retirement age, I believe he's so competent, and he's a man who is best qualified in the service now, so let me give you an extension. That's the same man who, a year on, says, um, something is so wrong, I cannot even wait for you to have the next three weeks so you can go peacefully. You need to go now. It, can, sh we should give him the benefit of the doubt, some say, that what has happened must have been absolutely legitimate, although we don't know why. The line is gone off. Okay, I don't seem... Okay. I think um, legitimate, yes. Prerogative, yes. The president is within his right to ask Mr. Asantia to proceed on leave. You see, the question that we are debating is the manner in which he was asked to proceed on leave and what the nature of that misdeed on the part of Mr. Asantia too might have been to the extent that we couldn't have waited for him to, indeed, we, it's not even three months, as we've been saying, or three weeks. It's not even three weeks. It's a matter of administratively, you know, he being advised, as indeed some have been asked to do, to put in a request to proceed on terminal leave. And then that being the administrative basis for the president to appoint Mr. James Opon Bueno in an acting position. The sole purpose in that approach would have been to save the image of the office of the IGP and the integrity of the police service, its morale and its esprit de corps amongst its officers. You see, so the situation now probably is creating a bit more harm to the integrity of the service not necessarily to the individual of Mr. Uh, appear to uh, Asante. And that is my concern, and I share that concern with a number of um, others who have expressed uh, similar views. Agree with that, that this has damaging impact, not only Asante appear to himself, but on the service that you once was a senior <laughs> officer in? You see, this issue of uh, contract appointments, the effects on serving members, officers, is that, number one, it demoralizes. You it know. does? Yes. It creates anger and bitterness. It destroys the spirit of core. And then, um, apart from the other point is that um, it also brings in apathy. Okay. You know. So... For me, we should learn from, our, from this experience. Oh, we'll, we'll come to the lessons. <laughs> but there's something very important I need to touch on from what um, retired Colonel had yeah, just but said. Then, then let me, let, let me uh, show something that the, the Presidential Commission uh, proposed and it was accepted by the government. Okay, which we, Presidential Commission is this? Acha. Okay. On contract appointment. Okay. You, you, maybe you can. Yes. Which, read it. Which, which part do you want me to read this part? Yeah, read this part. Okay. This is, no, start from here. Okay. Contract but, but, appointment. But, but, but this is the part that you want to emphasize. Contract appointment. The commission found that there are no clearly defined guidelines that govern the re engagement to the service on contract after personnel have passed the compulsory retiring age. Subject to Section 6 of the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana, uh, which is what you read earlier. The government accepts the recommendation, and this is the white paper. Yes. So this is government saying what they, they believe uh, is they will implement as, uh, from the ARCHA Commission. Accepts the recommendation of the commission that contract appointment should satisfy the conditions specified in paragraph, uh, and I'm going to go through it. An officer must possess the expertise that is not readily available. 
He must be declared physically fit by police medical standards. He must be capable of imparting his expertise to his subordinates within the contract uh, period. No contract appointment should exceed two years. An officer on contract shall not be eligible for promotion. Uh, an extra to the government statement on the report of the Representative Commission into the Ghana Police Service, released on the, uh, signed by the Secretary to the President, and this is Emis, uh, Emisa Atta, J.L. Emisa. No. To this, uh, J.L. Emisa. Yes, yes, to the uh, Police Council of Accra, uh, uh, and uh, etc. So this, this, this is what the Archer Committee found. And the, and the government then yeah, agreed to follow. That was in May 1999. Yeah. But You're saying that has that hasn't been followed? No, it's not been followed. Okay. No, but so you see, you see that contract appointments in the service now is, is just anything political. Yeah. And, and, you see, and you see let, let me just mm -hmm. end it here. Yeah. The, the regional commander of the Ashanti region mm -hmm. was promoted when he was, on, when he was just retiring. He was promoted, mm -hmm. okay, to commissioner and granted two years extension of service. Does it meet it doesn't. these requirements? It doesn't. You see, so all these things are creating a lot of... Uh, 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 Apathy uh, and, uh, and resentment uh, within the service. Resentment it, it, and you, you, think, you think, and, and Kenel, I'll come to you shortly, but Kenel makes a point that, yes, a contract appointment is an issue, but the manner in which Asante Pidu have been treated even makes it even worse. You, you think see, so? You agree? You see, you see, yes, it's true, but you see, it is, it is we, it is we officers in the police who have opened up ourselves to co politicians to treat us in this manner. Well, how, explain this. Democracy talks about rule of law, mm -hmm. okay? And so if, if, we ourselves are not insisting that things are done properly. The politicians also always take us for granted. But that's a very important point. There's a lot to question on this. <laughs> just, just before you come in, let's find out. So the way Asante Pitu have been asked to go, I think you're saying that... It, it has no respect to the office. Fine. Yes. I, I agree with that. But, uh, but, uh, but going further... You think the it, police it, have... It is, it is the way we have allowed... To stand their ground. Yeah. Very quickly, just clarify this for me. The way Asante Pitu have been asked to proceed on leave with, with a contract extension, you, you almost just suggest that this is an unprecedented move. It hasn't happened in the service before. The way yeah, because been. it's the second. It, when the fir the very first one, which uh, involved uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Achampon. No, 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 Mr. Mohammed Al Hassan. Al Hassan. He went. He, he went. He served the whole yeah. two years and went Quietly. as was expected. Yes. This one hasn't th hasn't happened like no, that. So this is like unprecedented. That. Yes. Okay. In a manner. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Now, uh, and you realize it happened that way because he was on contract. <laughs> yeah. Because if, for instance, if he had, let's say, a month to his retirement age, by law, the president couldn't have just sent him home. Mm. Mm. You understand me? By mm. law. But if you're on contract, the worst cases would have gone on um, on on terminal leave. Uh, exactly. Yeah. If it's on contract, it means the contract can be terminated it at any time. At any time by the president, because at that point you are literally at the mercy of the president. That is what it means. Mm. You are literally at the mercy of the president. But you and I know that if you have not reached the mandatory uh, sixty years mm -hmm. to go on retirement, or you like Chobu who decided to take an early exit. The president, in, I mean, he's incapacitated to send you home early. And so these are some of the things when you are talking about, you know, contract extensions, even though the president has that, you know, sole prerogative to, to do that. I think that within government circles, they should rethink mm -hmm. of how this affects the rank and file. Yeah. You know, because if you send someone as important as the inspector general of police who give him you don't really give him time you tell him with immediate effect yeah. with immediate effect it's almost like something so serious had happened now, and just like my colleague Colonel did Richard say said. I mean you, he gave you you know some prehistorical yes, antecedent yes. and that was 196 before Kwame Nkrumah yeah. was toppled it means that if we are going by that it means that that really has not happened. Like I was telling you, the only time under the fourth Republican Constitution we came so close, where this country literally grinded to almost a halt, yeah. was when Francis Poku 
had that issue with the executive president. Mm. I mean, you know what yeah. that generated. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and so and, for me, you don't treat heads of security agencies this way because if you do that, I mean, they are. And yes, I'll come to you yeah. because I want to go back to uh, Ken Officer Savage shortly. The retired, uh, Ken uh, retired. The, 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 we say all this, and all this is happening. Uh, I've heard of you mention this as unprecedented, and you go back to pre pre history, um, pre independence side example. But all this is happening at the very um, unstable time when it comes to security, not only in Ghana but in the sub region. Where you need a very, st if we ever needed a more stable police service, it will be 2019. Exactly. Um, uh, I mean, and it couldn't have come at such at any, at any, at any bad time. And my question really is, with all the analysis you've rendered on this and its implication, we have, some say it made it even worse because we have the deputy who is now acting. Um, within the context, within the, the, the sub-regional security context, and how security has become such a big thing now in this time, what do you think the general implications are on this country's security going forward? Seeing that the man who is taking the uh, position is acting. Well, I think the, the immediate challenge that we can all see is the disturbance in the continuity in the chain of command of the police service. Yes, Deputy IGP, Mr. James Opon Bueno, has served under uh, Mr. David Apia Asante. Mm -hmm. But assuming the seat of the IGP is not the same as, you know, being a Deputy IG. There are a lot of things that Mr. James Opon Bueno wouldn't have known about, mm. that Mr. David Asantia Pietu would have known about. Mm. So there is a break in the chain of command, in the continuity, in the institutional memory of the police, occasioned solely by the decision of the president to ask the IGP to proceed on leave. Mm. You know, without allowing time for a, a more smoother or smoother transition, you see. That is the immediate danger that I see. Of course, there could be implications in many other spheres. And I think our colleague Paul has alluded to some of them. I mentioned the morale of the police service, the esprit de corps, you see, it, and the the mindset of those who may be appointed eventually to occupy the seat of the IGP, knowing that they could also be treated in this manner. Mm. I think it does not go well for us. Uh, Indeed, there are mm. a few things that one can hazard. Yeah, yeah I, I thought yeah. I, you wanted to come in. No, so go, finish that point. Finish that point. Yeah, you see, I've said elsewhere, that as part of the paradigm of political violence that we are seeing in this country, there is a discernible attempt of what some of us have called state capture mm. by political actors, including political parties, to try and control the professional spaces of the security services. Now, this paradigm is different from the prerogative of a president appointing heads of security institutions. Mm. And unless we are told in very specific terms why the IGP has been asked to proceed on leave, I can make the valid assumption that it is part of the strategy of political parties trying to control security institutions. If indeed the IGP does not sing from the same hymn sheet that they want him to sing from. And that is not good for national security in the long run. It's not good for our national security and stability. Uh, Adam, yeah. you have an issue with the fact that um, Opombo is acting. Yeah. Um, Ken just makes a point that the, the way he's been handled, you don't allow proper transition. Oh, yes. And yeah. so it's going to create a problem for him. Yeah. But some say the logic in the acting position is that the president said it clearly in the statement that act until substantive. So the president is giving himself time to shop around and look for the best fit. 
before he confirms. Isn't that why that is a, sm a, a smart move? To have somebody acting now and not just necessarily put him there as confirmed just because he's deputy. You, you, you have an outgoing IGP, now mm -hmm. he's gone, who just like my colleague Colonel did allude to institutional memory. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things that, you know, an IGP would go through every 24 hours. And so if you get up one morning and his appointment is curtailed or is... I'm just suddenly. assuming that this happened suddenly. Maybe he's known that this will happen for a while. And we just got to know of it yesterday. How about... I mean, uh, no, I mean, it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. I mean, uh, like some of if us... This was sudden? This was sudden. I mean, that's what okay. it means. Yeah, it's sudden. And so basically what I'm saying is that it shouldn't have been because there should have been a smooth transition, mm. which is the norm. Which is what the president is going to do now, to set for a substantial... No, when I say a smooth transition, a smooth transition would mean that whoever becomes the substantive IGP, the acting IGP mm. would have to take over from the outgoing IGP in, you know, whatever briefs, I mean, whatever information that mm, is collected. Mm, mm, then he then mm. passes that information on to the substantive okay. IGP. So, so I guess the point you're making. So I guess that's what Kenneth was making the point. That there are things that uh, as an people will know that the deputy doesn't know. Exactly. And so you're expecting that a proper way to do this was for there to be time for Asante Pidu to brief and properly hand over. Hand over. Then he takes over and he's hitting the ground running because he knows where his yeah, boss exactly. has been. And if you look okay. at it, in an acting position, and, and you look at the manner in which the deputy IG, now acting IGP, uh, has taken over in a more hostile environment. Not his fault, though. I mean, it when you say hostile environment. When I, mean. I say hostile, I mean, you will get up one morning and probably you are summoned and you are bo you are asked now you are the IGP. you are now you are the acting I, IG okay, okay. and probably you have the uh, the dispatch rider in yeah. front of you you are driving in a GP1 instead of GP2 yeah. and, 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 and note that the IGP who you're just leaving suddenly will have people who are very loyal to him exactly who are still in the service uh, exactly who uh, then where is this guy coming uh, from uh, exactly and, and, and you have a situation where the political situation is no f so friendly to the security architecture of this country mm. and so you have uh, upon when who is going put in, in almost like a mouse trap where uh, he'll be looking over, his, over shoulders. his shoulders to see whether if he coughs or he sneezes his those who are, are they going to confirm me and so you don't want him to dance to the dictates yeah. of the president or dance to the dictates of the political commentators who go on radio stations, TV stations, to all they do is lambast and lambast. And so for me, I think that if you, this is, look at the, 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 the current statistics when it comes to crime, violent crimes. It's gone up by almost about 50%, yeah. violent crimes. Yeah. And so what it means is that this is the time you need a more stable, you know, security, uh, architecture. security architecture. But this is the time it looks like we are missing the point and we are not putting value on the but, but, but that is a question I ask, Kennel, and I'll bring it up. We know there's a lot yeah. to say. When I ask you this, you can go there. But shouldn't we say to ourselves that the president knows everything? He's a commander in chief. No, he's no, a no, you are wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm just assuming. The no, man is no, a commander no, no, in chief. No, no, you, you, he gets security briefing you, every day. You, Everybody goes to him. You my, are my, completely wrong. My, 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 this is my question, though. That he, he would have taken this decision knowing that there's a security implication would have considered all the factors that Kennel, retired adam had said and you have said and still thought that this and the president's primary responsibility to keep us safe so why would he take a decision like this when it's not really in the best interest of national security who would have definitely considered that was that we you see um um the acting is also a retiree on contract. He you is? Know. Yes. Oh, Mr. Bueno. Yes. Yeah, he and he's going to go in October. He's oh, going I in three months. months. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he's so going, he's he also. A you see, you see, the point mm. is that, you see, what happens was that he was also on, he was also due to retire. Well, he's on life support. When he was also promoted as deputy IGP. Oh. He was al al almost going home when he was appointed an IGP and given a contract. You see the way things are going. So he's just like his boss. And, yeah, yeah. But he's, he's just just like his boss. in October. Yes. yes. 
And so that you is see, what makes it so a bit tricky. So it shows that the police organization don't have a succession plan. Hmm. You see, we don't have a succession plan. If if we have because of the politics. Yeah, because the laws we, we are not forcing for the police service act, which is when you say we you want the police themselves yeah, the police. To, to force to push us through. Yeah. You are in it, so you know what is happening. How can the police do it? That, what's the practicality no, of that? No, you must. You should, we have the police council. We have the police council. Okay. So you are no. I know your history. You police, will stand up for this. Police, police, you, police, you, police. You left police, when you were being victimized. Police, police, but not police, everybody, the, police, can do the that. police council. What prevents police officers from writing a memo to the police council on matters such as this? We have. A lot of them who are lawyers. Even the lawyers themselves can come to the police council, chaired by the vice president. Yes. Why would they do that? The man at the helm of that is the president's yeah, but, boy. But what prevents you, the police officers, from. But the council a is memo. a political institution. Headed Give by me a moment to the police council oh, on what okay, is so they, they could have resisted. And if they uh, resist, you see, uh, they're, how? Not, they're good. Oh, I mean, they could have. Listen, so, uh, I mean, there's a president isn't, in this country. Isn't that an no, unrealistic I mean, the, 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 utopian no, suggestion? The, the, no, no, no. There is a president in this country. The, the former IGP, uh, Peter Tinganabang Namfuri. I mean, most police officers today who know him will tell you. Yeah. There was a time, I think it was, was it Adam Afi also when he was the interior minister? Mm. There was a time he said, you can take your work if you will not listen to me. You can okay. take your work if you not listen to me. And so as far as I'm concerned, yes, there might be some institutional challenges. But depending on how the police themselves are organized, they will be able to challenge some of these challenges and put it to the, uh, the, these political godfathers and let them know that. You so know I hear the two of you say one of the solutions to this problem is for the police themselves to fight for their independence. Yes. That's what you're suggesting. Together yeah. with the general public. And, and you say, second, and the, 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 secondly, you see, the, the, the most basic thing is for, 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 for a proper law. You see the, the, the provision that gives authority the, to the president to appoint an IGP in, in, in consultation with the, poli uh, what, the Council of State. It ends there. You see, there is nothing again. Mm. No eligibility criteria. So you want a law no, that yeah. is more specific. You see, if you, if you look at the law that governs the appointment of... Uh, the commissioners of the shrash is more specific. It is specific. The criteria is very clear. Criteria is there. The acting appointment is governed by that law. It's the politicians who pass eh? this law, eh? and they deliberately did that so they can control the security services. So yeah, so it's so, in their so, interest to change so, it. So, it so, them. so if the officers who are also divided, you know, the officers so are the, divided. So you're saying that they undermine the each police other. should unite. Yes. To fight the state of scope. Yes. Okay. Let me bring in Kenneth Fessy Sabwaji on that very controversial suggestion. Oh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth, do you do you agree? <laughs> yes, exactly. Do you agree with the positions expressed by uh, Paul, Paul and uh, and Adam Bona in the studio? And what would you add to the solution to this problem? Look, I appreciate their positions, but b before I speak to that, mm. let me point out that in theory. Presidents are supposed to know everything. Yeah. In practice, no. the reality is that they don't know everything. Okay. And sometimes they know only the things that persons close to them okay. want them to know. Okay. So under these circumstances, nobody really knows what the people surrounding the president mm. might have told him about what it is that Mr. Pierre Santé omitted to do or did. Having said that, I think the idea that the police service officers must themselves take matters into their own hands could, could create problems for the service. Indeed, I want to argue that it's a two-way street. The first part of the street, or one side of the street, is for politicians to allow the professional space for the services to function. Mm. And then the services themselves will learn to act professionally. Mm. But if tomorrow X number of police, uh, commissioners of police, 
wrote a memo to the police council. It could be misinterpreted. It could be seriously misinterpreted with repercussions for the careers of those officers. Mm. But I want to grant that there, it could be an avenue that they could explore. So we need to learn the right lessons from, from this situation. And I want to argue strongly that probably we need to manage the IGP's position like we are managing the position of the Inspector General, sorry, of the Chief of the Defense Staff yeah. currently. Mm. We need to regularize the transitions and to the extent possible, probably avoid this use or resort or recourse to this contract extensions and so on. Paul and I think Adam have suggested that it has serious repercussions when there are next line officers who are waiting, one of them, to occupy the seat of an IGP, and then you grant an extension. Exactly. But see, as you are granting an extension, you're also creating problems for the next level of officers to be aging. Mm. You see, and then you end up with a morale problem of the, of the senior officers. And I've heard elsewhere that there's a bit of apathy on the part of the commissioners of police. Mm. You know, who somehow are not very sure whether they're going to occupy the seat of the IGP, if indeed they so qualify. Mm. So I want to suggest that we should learn some lessons from this, from this. you know, uh, uh, so forward. that we, 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 we avoid a situation where we jeopardize uh, national security. Um, of I course, I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. that his departure is going to have untold hardships or whatever challenges for, for national security. But in academic terms, the transition has not been smooth. smooth. And as I've suggested, it has repercussions for institutional memory yeah. or the transfer of that knowledge from, look, in real life, what should have happened was that this IGP should have worked for about two weeks with the incoming yeah, which is what and Adam taking him to all suggested. sorts of places yeah. and open his eyes or her eyes and then being pulled out of the headquarters. You see, the pride of being pulled out of that headquarters itself is an encouragement for others to I to become an IGP. IGP. But if now, quietly, as Adam said, in the morning you rode to the office <laughs> in GP1, <laughs> by 12 o'clock or thereabout, um, that number plate probably has been removed. Your motorcade might have been reduced or removed. I mean, how can we treat a senior officer like that? Uh, Somebody who I, has worked for 30 years. Yeah. Can I, I'm, I'm we shouldn't do that. I, I'm grateful that you join us with those thoughts. We need to wrap up here. I give uh, mm. 30 seconds to you. First, I need to just wrap up for me with what will be a Santa Peter's legacy. You've done work on this already. So yeah, just, I mean, just give me legacy quick. legacy would be, you know... Uh, the transformation agenda he started. But there again, you see, when you're on contract, you're almost like you're on life support. Mm. And anytime anybody pulls the that uh, yeah, oxygen, you, life support, you they pull it, you die. And so you for me, you die with uh, your dreams. Uh, exactly. And, and so and that is what actually probably afflicted Asante Apia okay. too. And so this contract so the, thing. So the reforms? The, the reforms did something, did okay. some work. Well, what but, else? Uh, the reforms, and he got uh, probably during his time the largest uh, recruitment, 4,000 police officers since independence, they've never had that. And some vehicles came in. And so these are some of the things. Apart from that, the downsides, you are looking at crime rates went up and political violence, and it is during this time we've had uh, vigilantism. They passed, and I tell you, on the same day we had it passed was the same day he, he, was, he was fired. And so for me, let's not put them on life support. If, if, we, if you are if you are due for retirement, go. Oh, Mr. We have the final words, 30 seconds. Yeah, I think, um, like uh, Colonel said, said, I really know really about this to the police council. We should regularize appointment of IGPs and contract appointments. You know, stop all these uh, uh, bogus, uh, what we call it, uh, contract appointments. For me, if I will position all those. Even now, you see, what is happening now is that people who are supposed to go on terminal leave are still in office, working, and nothing is happening. I see. Such indiscipline, I guess. Yes, such indiscipline. Within the service, that's supposed to be very yeah, yeah, disciplined. Yeah, yeah.
Paul Avery, I'm grateful that you joined us with those frank thoughts. As a retired superintendent of police, uh, you earlier had Colonel Festus Abwaji retired, who had some strong views for us as well in Anam Bonam. Uh, thank you for joining us. I've learned a lot tonight. Um, um, you may be worried, but trust the president. I mean, theoretically, they say he knows everything. And so let's stay with that and hope that we make the decisions that best interest. Enjoy the rest of the day.